Yes.
Così. Cosa qua non funziona adesso? Non, non ho idea, non ho idea, non va. Ragazzi, se qualcuno di voi si è connesso, si può disconnettere un attimo, però non so se siete visti, se non potete essere connessi. Se non potete essere Bibi, a Torino potete mettere il punto per favore. Bibi, Beatrice, Teo, a Torino. Mettete il muto al microfono, per favore. Grazie. Here. No, no, okay, so we're about to start here in Beijing. In like one minute, we will have a short introduction about the workshop, and then we will start uh, with the first lecture. Okay, just give us a minute. Hello, everybody. I think if everybody's ready, I don't, you know, the thing is, I cannot even know if you can hear me now, but uh, that's okay. Yeah, okay, you, they can hear me. I think Arturo will start in um, one minute with a short introduction, and then we will start with the uh, overall presentation. Yes. Okay. So welcome everyone. It's a real pleasure to see you all virtually and uh, in reality for this 24-hour uh, workshop. It's been a bit of a struggle, but I'm really looking forward to see what the result of this is. And uh, so thank you very much for participating. Um, I would like to thank uh, all the teams that participated, which include um, from Delft, Istanbul, and uh, Turin, and Pennsylvania, and of course the people here in Beijing that helped us make it happen, the tutors everywhere <laughs> that are going to help us during this day, and all the lecturers that will participate. So really, this is a heartfelt thank from my side, and um, thanks for believing in this project. So I will leave the word to my friend and colleague Martijn, who will give a short introduction about what the meaning of this workshop is, and uh, what we're trying to set up, which is not only um, an event where we try to create some content and share it with other people, but we also want to create something like a network uh, that will help us keeping in touch um, in our future. So Martijn, I'll leave the word to you, and uh, thanks again. Okay, Shogong, is the camera also on? Okay, great. Uh, okay, welcome everybody. Not in the right spots. Yeah, 
we have a mark on the ground here that says where you need to be. Yeah, like this. Okay, thank you. Oh, now I can see myself. Um, okay, okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Um We're just starting the introduction of the workshop. We have all the teams around the world uh, linked to each other. So what I'm saying now goes out to uh, Beijing, Istanbul, Delft, Italy, Turin, and um, the U.S. in Penn State University, and um, actually live on the web for anybody to follow on YouTube. So it's kind of exciting. Uh, what will happen here? I will give a. This is the program um, to start here in Beijing. Um, I will give a short introduction about what the workshop will be like, and then Arturo will tell a little bit about how it's coordinated. Um, then we have a short introduction of all the teams around the world. I hope that will work in two minutes each, please. And um, then Mr. Chefe will start a lecture series in uh, Beijing. So first, uh, I'll tell a, a few words. Um, this workshop is a 24-hour workshop. It's an international independent workshop uh, that we uh, that we set up with uh, with the last 24 hours. It involves five universities around three continents, 10 to 20 uh, lecturers, and about 60 participants worldwide. So why do we start doing that? Um, actually. I think this, work, this workshop addresses the fact that the world is changing around us and because of this change we need a, a, a revolution. Um, this revolution revolves around uh, three change parameters. These were the three parts that made up sustainability as we know it these days. Um, people, planet, planet and prosperity. The fact this piece is actually missing one P which is politics and that is why it's so interesting we can hold this workshop now. Uh, to describe a little bit uh, these, these changes that lead to the need for a revolution, I want to describe how these changes affect the position of the architect, the things we can do as architects, and how we can create uh, a movement to respond to the changes that happen in the world around us. First of all, financial systems are changing. Uh, there's no longer uh, a belief in capitalism. Uh, this was the Dow Jones crashing in 2008 in the US. Um, First of all, there was a, a disbelief in socialism that didn't work out. Then, then they thought of capitalism that it should work. It also doesn't work. And together with that, we have a, a shift of interest around the globe. There's no longer a single dominant power, but it becomes uh, a, a pluriform uh, power system uh, based upon money. Then secondly, the change in social cultural values. There's no longer, again, a singular ideology. People can live from all over the world in, in, in certain countries. For instance, this is Holland, where I come from, um, where there is um, uh, in centers where African people uh, are living, or this is a Chinatown, again, in Holland, where not only people are displaced into, into cultures that are not their own, but also uh, cultures are displaced into other cultures that, that might not have belonged there before. Uh, thirdly, we have the environmental conditions that are changing. Uh, I think this uh, Kevin Costner uh, depicted that quite well in his movie uh, Water World. And this can lead to negative changes, such as the flooding of cities, like New York, quite recently, that, that kind of happened, or in London. It could also create uh, positive conditions, uh, like here in Holland, where the water could warm up and we could start growing rice, perhaps, in the future. On the other hand, in China, this uh, lack of water is leading to serious environmental uh, problems in cities. I mean, there's a bridge here because there used to be a river, but because of the drought, the river in the summer is no longer there. What I want to focus on with this workshop, though, is that political processes are, are changing around the world. That means um, there's no longer Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, we now have the power of the network. It's no longer about the individual as a, as a singular person. Again, it's no longer about one power, one ideology, one individual. We have networks that, that enable us to, to communicate with each other, to share our ideas, and to create content together, expressed in, for instance, uh, LinkedIn or Weibo. Um, on the other hand, these processes also directly influence the cities we have around us. This is an example of um, uh, a town in, in Europe where the community itself can address problems that they want to be um, have addressed in the com community council. So when there's enough votes for creating a sports park, they will talk about it in a municipality. So what does that mean for the profession of the, uh, of the architect? Um, where initially uh, the architect is a person responsible for inventing or realizing a particular idea or project. 
it doesn't necessarily have to do with buildings, according to the um, according to the uh, dictionary. So it's, we see in, in people like Rem Kohlhaas who take this idea quite further with this idea of the En Europa trying to address issues of energy politics and, and um, climate change on a bigger scale. What we can do uh, is that architects respond to the changes around the world because it's the field we operate in. And according to Bernard Tsumi, we could act as revolutionaries by using our environmental knowledge, meaning the understanding of cities and, and, and the mechanisms of architecture, in order to arrive uh, or be part of professional forces trying to arrive at new social and urban structures. So what is this context the architect operates in today? It is what's been called the Anthropocene. It's the first time in human history uh, where an age is named after the, the most dominant species. Normally geological eras are called after a certain time period. Uh, Pleistocene or Holocene or, or whatever, um, uh, the Jura era. Uh, this era, the Anthropocene, is called after Anthropos. It means the human age. It's the first time that a species is the, is the main influencer on the, on the shape of the earth and no longer the geological forces. So we enter the urban age, which is, different, is happening in different speeds in different countries around the world. Uh, for instance, this is uh, Shanghai. The previous image was Hong Kong. Uh, but this is Paris, also looks quite urbanized. The thing is, how do you respond to these changes as an architect, as a student, as a, as a person? I think we should not uh, think in doom scenarios. We're no doom thinkers. Uh, we should narrate into a continuum. And we should crack open these, these locked down contemporary societies that still think quite conservatively. And we want to address that in this theme to go beyond the city. Everybody's been focusing on urbanization inside of cities, but few peoples have actually addressed what this urbanization means on the land outside of cities. And what is most interesting with these new networks that we can create is that um, this, this stage of urbanization is happening in different, oh, it's, hard to, it, it's happening in different speeds around the world. So where, for instance, Cambodia is, is the dot on the left with um, only like 15% urbanized. Uh, where maybe Turin or, or Delft or Holland is on the top with maybe 95% urbanized. In between, we have a range of, of conditions, even Detroit, which is already losing its urbanity. There's a range of choices that happen simultaneously, but actually plot down on a curve which, which goes through time. So we can observe these moments on the same curve simultaneously when we talk with these people around the world. And we could think of what does it mean to, to, to go beyond the city? How does the city evolve? We started living as dispersed settlements all over the world. Um, then we, we kind of currently have this form of condensed urbanity where all the urban life centers, uh, centers to certain focal points, like here in Beijing or in Amsterdam or, or, or wherever in New York where you go. So what kind of futures can we imagine? Can we imagine... Um, the rural countryside or, or the ex city or the after city or the integrated city, the interwoven city. I mean, we basically ask what exists beyond the city? What is out there? Um, are we talking about farming? Uh, are we talking about infrastructure? Are we talking about nature? Are we talking about uh, industry? These are issues that architects don't think about too much these days. And I think we want to look creatively at the relation between the urban and the non-urban, city and nature. So how do we do that? That is, that is the third point I want to stress, especially with this workshop. I think what is interesting, if you look throughout history, is that you see three major movements who have had a rapid change in context and changed also the discourse of architecture, where you had Vitruvius, who used a certain medium of the manuscript to come to a certain architecture, that of the Roman Empire, the style of, of the Romans. Then we had Alberti in the, in, the, in the 17th century with the invention of the book printing press that was able to create, in the end, the Renaissance. And as we've seen in the early uh, 20th century, we had the invention of the periodicals in the Industrial Revolution, where people like uh, movements like the Stel or Bauhaus or Le Corbusier used this periodical to create the moment of modernism. So currently we have similar changes in context and we have you we have digital media and perhaps we can create a new type of uh, future not a new future we can create the future so how do we do that 
first of all, we connect. That is what we initiate right here. That is what we initiate in cities around the world through the media, through whatever. Then we use a certain period to create. We think about these problems integrally. We connect with each other, we share our ideas, and we create um, opportunities, scenarios, strategies. And what happens is that we then share these, these, these uh, creations. So we connect, we share, and we create. And this can all happen simultaneously, synchronously, all around the world. This has not been possible before. Vitruvius only could uh, think of something. He could write it down as an encyclopedia because there was no ways to spread it. Alberti, he was able to create books to, to put in libraries, but it was not accessible for the creation. In the periodicals, people could create content together and, and spread it out, but we are able to do everything simultaneously. We can share, create, uh, connect, and reiterate. So it's a process that evolves. We can continuously respond to changes that happen around us and, and go again. So the image I showed Eel earlier actually comes from a book by Malcolm Gladwell. It's called, uh, it explains the idea of the tipping point. It is, when a it is how a certain effect travels through a certain society. What happens, he identifies three people. He says there are connectors, mavens, and salesmen. The connectors are people that, that connect, right? So let me imagine like this. A maven is somebody that decides to wear a black tie. Then maybe somebody else tomorrow thinks, hey, that's a nice tie. I'm, you know, I should tell my friend that that tie is very nice. That's a salesman. Then he comes to somebody and says, um, you know, I'm going to tell all my friends about this because you, you made me realize this tie is fantastic. So he spreads it out through the network. That's the connector. And that's also how we work these days. We have people starting ideas. We have people evaluating those ideas, uh, sharing them. Um, you know, not everything is worth sharing. And then we have spreading. So what we can do currently is instead of looking at a problem from, from the outside towards the inside, we can use this problem positively to influence the context around us. So we can create workshops to, to create content. We can share it across all kinds of networks. Uh, we can discuss these ideas, and we can intricately uh, connect them with all kinds of media around the world, easily spreading the context. We can work interdisciplinary with people from different disciplines in different types of projects. We can work, we can locate these projects in certain, in certain fields and areas where we can link to them instead of, instead of just creating them, we, we can influence them also as architects. We have tools such as websites free and, and open source to create, to create a communities where people can connect, or like this one, Archinect. Uh, we have Twitter, for instance, or Weibo, uh, where we can even see how influential the ideas are that we spread. So this is my timeline plotted against the influence it has around the network and which people uh, link with that. And all these things together I think we can create what I call towards a future habitat. Uh, we can design the conditions of life. Um, okay, so far for the introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I should switch to uh, Arturo now, and then we go on. He will explain a little bit about uh, what's going on. Uh, so you can stay also here with me, I mean. Um, so basically what's gonna happen today is that um, all these people that you see here behind me are working and uh, <laughs> to make this happen with us. And these 24 hours have quite a tight program, even though we will try to keep it as kind of relaxed as possible within the time. So we're going to have a number of lectures from uh, around the world that you will be able to assist anywhere you are and ask questions also. Um, in this time, we will have some breaks, of course, with uh, aperitivo and um, beer and what is the cookie eat biting thing from the Netherlands and, um, and some pizza and whatever. So we also try to make this event a thing that, you know, as Martin said, uh, it's about creating and sharing content, but it's also about enjoying the company of other people that, you know, believe in this and, um, and, and try to work for this. 
and, um, and get to meet new people. I'm really happy, for example, because here in Beijing I know very few of the participants. So that's, you know, uh, something that I was really looking forward to. Um, so I guess that's basically it. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, you can introduce the city. Okay, so here we go with the introduction from every city. I will leave one second the word to you, Martin, so I can go to the workstation to do that. So one at a time, maybe we can start from uh, Delft. You want to start from here? Oh, no, sorry. We can start from here. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, then I just go with with this one. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll continue for one one minute. Um, what we do in Beijing. We focus on this site, which is called uh, Twendixia, which is a, a village uh, about uh, roughly 90 kilometers to the west of Beijing. And what we see, actually, if we look at Beijing as a city, we see Beijing as a city uh, is a very kind of closed city, and inside of the city we have patches of green. Around the city of Beijing, especially on the north and western parts, there's a lot of green with patches of city life. For instance, we can see in this this diagram. All the white is urban area, all the black is uh, a green area. You can see how these patches uh, integrate along the, the edges. Uh, what we try to do uh, in Beijing is we will look at an overall, we work on three skills, so we look at the overall strategy to develop these patches of city life in, in the green, and we look at one example in particular, which is this village of Twendixia. Uh, this village actually is a, a founded in the uh, Ming Dynasty, it's quite an old village, and What's interesting about it is actually two things. First of all, it's, it's totally embedded uh, in the nature. It used to be the last stop of um, uh, tradesmen on, on horses and car uh, horses and um, camels coming from Xinjiang, traveling to, to Beijing. So it was a kind of hostile area, the last point of rest before entering Beijing. And it has very well preserved uh, courtyard houses, which we can see here, uh, foiled against the mountain. Only problem is that, um, well, basically, maybe there is no problem. We will just look at uh, the fact that this village has been totally undeveloped still, and how that can tie in with other similar conditions on the edges of uh, Beijing. So then we better go to the next one, and we can arrange some things right here. Uh, next one is Delft. Okay, Delft, you can connect your microphone and um, and tell, tell us a bit about what's happening in your city. All right, can you hear us? Yes, yes, here we can. Good. Um, well, so we're in Delft now, which is quite a small city, I would say, uh, and sort of the bigger agglomeration in the Netherlands is called uh, the Randstad which houses about 7 million people, so it's actually quite comparable to, to big cities like uh, Beijing or Istanbul. And um, our assignments, our challenge is basically on three skills. On, on the Randstad scale, we're looking at uh, the landscape qualities. So it's actually quite interesting that we have sort of a ring of cities around Greenheart, which is currently under a lot of pressure, uh, but we'll address that in our assignments of how to deal with this. And then we will zoom in uh, to an area which is called the best land, which houses a lot of greenhouses. So there's quite a big pressure between uh, infrastructure, between uh, rural economy of the greenhouses, but also recreational qualities. And then finally, we'll, we'll zoom in into Delft, which is you know a small city in this little Randstad, uh, but also borders uh, also to the Westlands and also to the east to other uh, green areas. So how can you interact between well this very it's, it's quite a clear city, it has a church, you know, it's a real city city, but also how can you connect to the countryside, which is quite uh, close in distance. So we'll address these issues uh, in our city, uh, the Randstad. Thank you. Thank you. We, we heard that, although we had a slight delay. So on, on one monitor, we see you already finished. On the other monitor, you're still talking. So one second.
We got all of your introduction on the three skills. That was all, all, all very good. Thank you very much. Maybe we should switch to the next city first. Can you, I mean, can they, can they say something? What? Hello, Delft. <laughs> yeah, they're here. Okay, here we are here. But uh, next city is Abrams. Okay, who is next? Next is Istanbul. Istanbul, please. We're just going up. Hello, hi. Do you hear us? Yes. Okay. Uh, we can also see you. Yes, hi. okay. Uh, we will do screen share so you will see the whole presentation. Okay, that's good. Go ahead. So we're gonna get, you know, prepare it a little bit. One second. One second. Okay. <laughs> can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, we will right. start then. So this is Team Istanbul for 24-hour workshop. This is the team. Um, our subject is the third bridge, but it's actually not the third bridge, it could be fourth or fifth. Uh, it's just about the uh, development of Istanbul and how the city is moving north. Uh, so this area is the historical part of Istanbul, and uh, before the uh, bridges over the Bosphorus were built, uh, Istanbul had the east to west orientation, but as the uh, bridges were built, uh, it moved north and then it started to uh, destroy the natural resources, northern forests, and uh, water reserves. Sorry, Sorry yeah. Istanbul, we have a little problem because uh, us and also Matthijs, we can only just see a white screen. Ah, uh, okay. Mm, uh, I don't know exactly why. All right, so we will switch to, uh, not to share the screen, but um, we can do... Okay, uh, now we see it, actually. Uh -huh. ah, okay. Now you see? All right. Yeah, okay. now we Is can it see it. Now? Yeah, okay. uh, wait, now it's again all white. Uh, okay. When we do full screen, then okay. you... Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. like this works. Yeah, okay. it's general. Okay. okay. Is it better? <laughs> yeah, sorry, but uh, I mean... All right. Is it working? Is yeah, it working? yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is Istanbul. Okay, we're, we're the, going. The, the red... Um, Route is the uh, up in the north is the red route is the new route of the third bridge. But uh, it's actually the fourth bridge because uh, an, another bridge uh, is going to be built here. This is in the plans. Wait, now we see you, but we don't see the presentation. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's Come a, on. I mean, yeah. technical issues yeah. are part of the game. Um, okay, then we will just yeah, we will turn the computer. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a. Yeah, this works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you see the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but it's working. It's working. It's, uh, yeah. Okay. Nine to push. Is a man present to you. Every auto. One of the projects. In the meanwhile, the next team, which is Pennsylvania, get ready to present once they're done, and then we'll have Turin, okay? Okay, so this is the route for the third bridge, and uh, uh, when we were uh, talking about these subjects, we actually made kind of a catalog that is uh, telling about how the third bridge, uh, when it will be built, uh, what kind of other projects that will follow it. 
So uh, one is uh, Canal Istanbul, it's Channel Istanbul. Uh, there is this uh, speculation of making another Bosphorus in the city, uh, even though the experts are saying this is impossible to dig all the uh, mountains and uh, hills and uh, lakes, whatever, uh, they're still uh, planning something like this. Can you uh, uh, tilt the camera a bit up, please? Yeah. Uh, okay, a little bit, yeah. Okay. I Can you see the island? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So this Thanks. is the island that's going to be built from the soil that will come from Channel Istanbul. And this is another project which would destroy uh, the forest and build some new like city. This is another project which is more like uh, simulations of the Bosphorus. So while the actual original landscape is being destroyed, they're making simulation uh, landscapes. And this is so absurd and so general and so common that even the comedians are pretending to be uh, politicians that are changing the city. These uh, are some snapshots, how it develops, and you can see the background, the forest, and, and uh, there are some new developments. These are examples done by the state itself. The state has some uh, uh, ways and they are building these houses for the poor, they It's say. called Toki. <laughs> And this, these are really on beyond the city, on the edges, like near the highways, where it's really hard uh, to access to the center. And there is another project which is called uh, New Istanbul. It's another center in the northern uh, waterfront for three million people with a new airport. And um, we actually think this is actually a Photoshop urbanism. The whole landscape of Istanbul is being disregarded and it's just being uh, used in <laughs> Photoshop like from a 2D uh, image and uh, the whole topography of the city is being uh, ignored and uh, forgotten. And uh, this is actually like how Istanbul works. Uh, small scale, it has been informal uh, development, but now the informality has uh, risen to large scale. So actually, uh, legally, it's done like that. There are legal tricks that uh, the laws change that uh, help that make people be able to build in forests and uh, these areas. So we, we, we discuss yeah, we will be discussing about uh, this uh, right to the city. Get we can can we develop something about this situation, about this uh, third bridge, uh, starting from this third bridge projects and the following um, um, uh, this crazy projects we call it. And um, so, what happens to right to the city, city. when the access of people, public, uh, the natural resources, forest and waterfront is taken from the people. So this is what we are going to be discussing and we have approaches. All the groups, we, three different groups will be working on three different approaches. Uh, one is waterfront, they will be uh, discussing uh, what will happen to waterfront. Uh, the other one is the highway orientation, so uh, the settlements near the highway, the rural areas, what's going to happen to them. And the third approach is the existing urban area, what will happen when another um, city with the same population will come to Istanbul. And these are basically it. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. All right, um, so I guess we can go on to next one, which is Pennsylvania. Hey Jimmy, you're there? Okay. <laughs> Jimmy, can you hear us? Yeah, I have to turn the microphone on for it to work, don't I? Okay. Yeah, Good. right. <laughs> All right, so we leave you to your presentation. Okay, so uh, we are doing a regional state of Pennsylvania. Um, I think we're the one team that is not actually a city. In fact, we're, where we're located is just about as far as you can get from any major city. Uh, in the East Coast. Uh, we are a four and a half to five hour drive to New York City, a three and a half hour drive to Pittsburgh, uh, three and a half hours to Washington DC. Um, and there's, yeah, there's really not much of an urban center um, in the state of Pennsylvania. However, through our history, 
uh, we've had a very close relationship with cities and that we provide them with a lot of resources. Um, initially, there was a lot of um, lumber production where uh, they cleared literally the entire state of Pennsylvania. Um, the entire state of Pennsylvania has been logged over two to three times. Um, after that, there was a, a coal boom where coal was used for heating and energy purposes. Um, and this has been the history of the state of Pennsylvania. It's been extraction from uh, the rural areas in order to feed the urban areas. Uh, this continues through to this day. Uh, we're in the midst of a natural gas boom uh, called Marcellus Shale, gas drilling, uh, also known as fracking or hydrofracking. Uh, it's a big issue in Pennsylvania right now because uh, you know, for some people there's a potential to make a whole ton of money. Um, but there's also this great danger of environmental degradation. Um, with this drilling and this exploration uh, comes a lot, of, um, a lot of outside people for temporary times. Uh, this is like looking to be another boom and bust uh, economy for Pennsylvania. Uh, so our strategy is to sort of zero in on the Marcellus Shale process, um, trace out the system in as detailed a way as we possibly can, uh, and look for places in which we can make the smallest change and create the greatest impact uh, in working towards a more mutually beneficial, uh, beneficial relationship between the urban and the rural. And that's our plan. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, next and last team, Turin, what are you up to? Can you hear us in Turin? Okay. We can't hear you right now. Can you? Okay. I uh, just want to say that with a semi Can you turn the microphone a bit up, please? Yes. Yeah, wait. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay. 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 I just want to say first that we decided to take part in this project, especially for the role given to the students. Uh, here we are nine people working in the local team. We are all from a student organization called Clinton. Then we have 12 participants, four tutors, and two lecturers. Uh, our team is the space between Milan and Torino. Uh, not the axis connecting, not the axis connecting the two poles, but this, a wider space in the middle of these two poles. We call this space middle territories. So our focus will go beyond the two poles, will go beyond the city, uh, in special terms, but also in terms of global trends. So. We want uh, no speculation Second. anymore, no more great event strategies. Uh, we want to focus on potentials uh, of the landscape and we want to focus on the relationship between the rural and urban space. We think that this theme is very peculiar for Italian situation, so that's it. Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, thanks a lot. So, can we start with the... Um... Okay, so we're going to take a couple of minutes to get ready here for the first presentation in Beijing. Uh, we'll be right back at you in like five minutes. Thanks.
crowded. Okay, you can turn on the mic and just introduce yourself. Oh, you can. Yes, I can start. I'll just read some of uh, this. Yes. Okay. Be fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. 24 hours. 24 hours. That's true. That's true. Last. Are you done? Yes. We're ready? Okay, ready. Okay, as our uh, first speaker and um, in this uh, lecture series, workshop, uh, whatever, I'd like to introduce Mr. Chiffet, who I think is especially well suited to lecture in this workshop environment because uh, he is not only a registered architect in Germany, actually, uh, but he's been practicing in, in China as architect also for some time, where his office, called CU Office, does not only focus on architecture but also creates. Um, Actually, workshops, I think you do, uh, gallery spaces, uh, all kind of exhibitions and things. And he is part of a new generation of, uh, of architects here in China, as we all try to be as well, I guess. So a very warm welcome to Mr. Chefei. Hope you all enjoy it around the world. Thank you. Uh, it's actually very pleased to come here and join this uh, event, join this 24 hours workshop. And first, the beginning, I, I want to say, uh, actually, I'm wondering how can make this uh, workshop. So it's very uh, interesting topic, 24 hours in different place. But now, should I say good morning or good evening or good day? <laughs> so this is a question. And this is exactly this question is go to our topic of this uh, workshop, what can be. And there is the question is how. And how is uh, perfect? You, you already have very good organization, so you answer this question already. But there are some other questions, when and where. So that is the, uh, the, the question. Uh, exactly, uh, for example, where? We actually in a different uh, space, but in the same class classroom, exactly like uh, now. So we are in Beijing, we are in uh, Derfort, uh, Etc. Istanbul, and also the times. That is also a different uh, uh, issue. So we are in the same time, but in different time. Uh, that is uh, that is the the topic of this. Uh, I think let's go back to this uh, this uh, workshop. Okay, my uh, my uh, my presentation, my lecture's name is uh, Mosul. Is just uh, some uh, pronunciations, and this is my uh, some uh, uh, method for design. I will de describe this later. And uh, the lecture has uh, three different elements. First is topic st statement. Actually, I have already said something. The second part is a theoretical review. Of course, focus of Beijing, our team, and our uh, local set, and the third part is uh, uh, methodology. So the first uh, uh, topic is about uh, uh, why we can make this uh, uh, workshop 24 hours in different uh, times, in different uh, time zones, different area, but in the same class, in same time. And this is, of course, this is related with uh, globalization. And is it possible to have something beyond the city? Is it possible to have a, a, globali a globalized urbanism? So this is the, the, the uh, hypothesis of this lecture. And first, I want to show you some uh, pictures. You, you see these pictures. Uh, it's very uh, looks like uh, globaliz uh, globalism or, or globally uh, globalization uh, urban area or something like this uh, nowadays. But left actually is uh, the Manhattan. The right one is in Beijing, and you see the very similar. Uh, actually, the physically is a similar uh, city image, but if you of course the 
the image is more about uh, high uh, density, but with different meaning. That is the uh, point. The left one in Manhattan, you see the, the towers, but most of them is, is offices, is commercials, is banks. But the right one is almost all of them is residence. So this is the difference. And this images is something about high rise. You can see the left is New York. It's always right is Beijing. Uh, New York, uh, actually, the Manhattan. You say uh, this is something about uh, uh, open city, but the right one is actually the fancy city. You can see the wall, uh, the gated uh, residence area, the compound. And these pictures also, the li uh, the left is uh, something. Uh, this is showing the villa and also showing uh, the. The private space. The left one is, uh, you say this is more fancy, gated, uh, defense private space. But the right one is more open, of course. But the, uh, the, the right one is in Beijing is some uh, uh, expensive uh, uh, gated community, uh, gated compound. And this is something about public space. The 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 public space in Manhattan and public space in Beijing. The left one is very similar uh, stage. It's, it's all, always like a stage in this public space. You can see, but the left one, the people showing the difference. But the right one, uh, the people going to integrate. So this is a different, different. Uh, uh, the left one is more uh, extroverted. The right one is more integrated. So this is uh, some uh, pictures. I want to say uh, in the similar, uh, how to say, uh, city image, under the similar uh, city image, but in different local, different sites, they have uh, different uh, uh, meanings. And that is uh, the globalization. And that is the start point from uh, our topic, this uh, globalized uh, urbanism. Uh, and after that, I, I, will, I want to uh, say, uh, following with this topic, uh, globalization, global, uh, globalized urbanism, we have uh, uh, time and space. Like uh, in the beginning of the lecture, I say, I said, this uh, same time and the same space or, or offset. So it's, uh, we have this universal time and universal space in this uh, global world. And under uh, this uh, phenomenon, I will give you a case, uh, architecture case study about uh, these two terms. And the left one is echo of modernism. The right one is echo of modern space. So you, you know, you are architect students, you, 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 all of you very familiar, Bauhaus building in Dessau. And IKEA, but this IKEA is in Beijing. And following this, I want to uh, um, decoding what what is meaning uh, uh, universal time and uni universal space in architecture uh, domain. And this uh, two echo is actually uh, present or represent uh, uh, modern modernity or modernism in the past uh, uh, many years. And so we, we will say uh, from uh, universal time to specific time and also the space. And this is the two story for, uh, about uh, Bauhaus building and uh, IKEA's uh, uh, shop in, uh, or market in, in, in Beijing. And the left is Bauhaus story. You say the very, very beginning uh, is built uh, around 1928 by, of course, uh, Bauhaus school. Uh, but um, but image maybe is not really clear. But the second one uh, in in 38, uh, the the Nazis uh, put some slope uh, roof rooftop on the under this uh, 
this modern building and uh, make it more, they, they call it uh, the high mart. So it's like some nationalization style. And uh, so this is forced uh, change. On um, 1945, you say the, uh, by the Second World War, this um, uh, bomb attack, uh, UK uh, Air Force, they destroyed the, the facade of the building. You see the glass facade is uh, damaged. On um, 1958, uh, it is uh, DDR, is uh, socialism, uh, East Socialism uh, uh, Germany, and uh, they uh, uh, re, uh, regenerate the building facade uh, with brick, no glass wall, because the announcement, uh, they say, uh, uh, glass facade is represent uh, capitalism, and the brick uh, facade is represent uh, socialism. So that they change the the facade. And on 1976, uh, also by DDR, they ha they uh, uh, they rebuild, uh, re how to say, retreat, or go back to the to the historical uh, Bauhaus uh, buildings uh, facade. So they, uh, because they want to uh, make a little bit different or maybe rethinking what about uh, modernity, what about Slovenian modernism. So maybe there are some alternative uh, 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 model. On 1990s, after uh, the, the Cold War, and the two DDR and the West Germany they integrate so that uh, they make decision to uh, to how to say uh, make the the Bauhaus building go back like the original one, but for of course for tourism uh, reasons. So by different reasons, you you say the the building's facade is and also the the. The program is so always changing, 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 and behind of this phenomenon is uh, is actually uh, uh, they put different architectural style or ideological things into this physical structure. And the right one is uh, IKEA. Uh, in Beijing, uh, IKEA we have uh, uh, we have actually. Uh, uh, three floor more open. Uh, you will uh, uh, generally you you go inside. You use the uh, elevator go up. So it's always uh, top down the, the 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 road. You go to the rooftop and going down. And one time I upset. So I I I, I from the down to top. And this is the fourth floor. There are only the boxes. The second, there are some uh, goods. The third floor, there are some uh, uh, like uh, uh, showroom or some fake uh, home home making or home home like space. And I'm really wondering is uh, uh, if you go uh, from top down, uh, top top uh, top down, you will first uh, enjoying this lifestyle. And going down, you buy this old stuff, and uh, you choose something, and uh, you're really going down to the first floor. You 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 find you can bring all of stuff uh, with box to home, so that it's very uh, practical. In this case, uh, IKEA space they they like uh, miracle things. They make miracle things. Everything. Made by box and this box uh, booming and explosion to be a uh, a city or to be a uh, 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 human environment. So that is the somehow like like the secret of the of the space of the uh, IKEA's space. And this phenomenon is showing the uh, the 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 space how they. Make a uh, universal space to be uh, uh, to uh, into the daily life, and this is the the brick uh, uh, Bauhaus building. And you can uh, from this image we we know uh, 
this kind of uh, universal uh, times uh, give the architecture some uh, historical or linear historical uh, uh, thinking like uh, styles, uh, following with styles. And this is the Ikea's case. So you see the, the, the map from the first, uh, second, third. You'll see the first uh, actually very access. The second is uh, floored. Third one is very folding. Actually, the, the typology of these three maps is from uh, supermarket market plus European traditional market plus and window dressing. And this is the, the actually deconing of this, uh, this mark, the, of this, uh, how to say, IKEA space. And this is a miracle. So I, I need to read this sentence for uh, globalized urbanism announcement. Uh, in the same architecture, we have different architecture Globalized urbanism make architecture different. Globalized urbanism is not a universal architecture style or lifestyle, but a specific architecture style and personal lifestyle. Therefore, globalized urbanism not is something, but is, isn't something. Nowadays, you create your architecture and your personal lifestyle when all that is solid melts into air, everyone is architect. So this is uh, the answer for the future. And now we go into the second uh, topic, China's urbanization under uh, globalized urbanism. And this is uh, every everyone knows, especially in China, we knew this uh, phenomenon, this city image. And Beijing is exactly a, a perfect case because many other cities in China, they, they learn from Beijing, they use a similar pattern to, to build up their uh, future cities. And this is exactly what looks like this kind of uh, high-rise city. And this is the many uh, statistics and numbers. I don't want to really uh, read it, but uh, because it's really familiar, everyone know China is a uh, uh, very fast, uh, uh, rapid development about urban uh, urbanization. And, uh, also industrial, construction industrial. And this is also some ne uh, numbers like uh, total sum of uh, construction, industrial, quantity of towns, quantity of cities, urbanization area, living space for, for peoples, every range. So it's changing a lot from uh, uh, 1978 to till today. So it's like uh, after this uh, 30 years reforming and uh, opening, China changed a lot. And we, of course, we, we, we produce a lot of uh, uh, urban space. And I want, uh, I want to show you Beijing. And this is exactly a uh, space and uh, time model of uh, to showing uh, the Beijing development. So I called it uh, annual rain city. Uh, you see there are a lot of uh, like a radio city, Beijing. And uh, you see the history of the development uh, of Beijing city. From the very beginning, palace city, the forbidden city built in 14,021. Uh, 14, uh, it's take only three kilometers. And uh, in the same year, they finished the uh, imperial city, inner city, built up. Uh, and after like, uh, uh, over 100 years, uh, in 1553, uh, it's growing to the first uh, uh, suburban, uh, suburban area. We call it outer city. Uh, it's 18 kilometers long. 80, kiter, uh, 80 kilo, kilometers long take 100, uh, over 100 years. And uh, 
from 1960s to 1992, so it's like 32 years, we, we built second ring road around the uh, city center. It's take uh, like a 32.7 kilometers long. And the third ring road, fourth ring road, fifth ring road, sixth ring road, and now it's going to seventh. Seventh ring road is going to 500 kilometers long and more and more fast. You can see the time is uh, very, uh, more and more bigger and more and more fast, faster. So this is the, the, the developing of uh, physical space and, and time in Beijing. And behind of this phenomenon, uh, we say now Beijing is very uh, tropical jams. They are growing so fast. There are a lot of uh, uh, traffic uh, uh, debating all questions. And uh, we have to say this uh, radio, uh, radio city model uh, actually uh, coming from uh, the CBD model. So they, they imagine the CBD is in the very beginning of this plan. They imagine the CBD is in the downtown, in the city center. But uh, I'm actually, the, the, the center is in uh, Forbidden City. So from this uh, model, it should be in the city center more and more dense and more and more efficiency, but there are uh, Fancy it, forbidden city. That is uh, one the question. One of the question for the traffic jam of today. Okay, I show you more uh, with analysis uh, social social spatial structure of Beijing. And we know we uh, China uh, is a socialism country and is tr is uh, reforming and uh, developing after these 30 years. But before the 30 years, uh, in, uh, in uh, how to say, the classical or traditional socialism country times or age, so we have this uh, pattern so that our transition or our city's uh, changing is actually from uh, planning society to a market society or from a planning city to a, a free market city. So this is the, the changing. And this model is showing the, the planning uh, uh, society or times, uh, how it works. So in, 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 the, in the sun,
so fast to to build or to produce so many different uh, new towns or new new cities. And and after that, uh, so I, I I want to say uh, from the uh, planning uh, time, so we we start to reform and we have. Uh, uh, community development in China, especially in, in, in the city, and this community development, uh, we have many years development, so uh, terms and also uh, legally, and uh, our urban planning model is especially for the residents community is is coming from this grating model uh, of the whole. Uh, Human settlements. Actually, this model is something from uh, Slovenian's uh, settlement model, and also a little bit uh, learn from or study from uh, Americans' pattern, like uh, some uh, compound pattern. Uh, and this this uh, formula showing this uh, grading model, like very very. Uh, different uh, three different level from uh, uh, developing group is like uh, neighbor, neighborhood is like 300 uh, uh, householder or thousand to 3,000 inhabitants compound and also <clears throat> residential district, uh, district. Plus the the Chinese city, so it's like cells. They it's growing and change itself, and everything is related. The governance, everything is related to the inhabitants, and also related to the physical <laughs> physical uh, uh, scale or physical structure. And this is exactly a, a, a typical Chinese city. So this kind of unit creates the. Uh, the Chinese city. Okay, after this uh, 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 sector, uh, uh, we're going to the last one, uh, architect under globalized urbanism. So first I want to uh, show a little bit of my office. So uh, my office, I'm not a traditional uh, LDR architect, especially in China context. Uh, our office has uh, three different uh, sector, CO office, CO pool, and CO space. CO office is our design office. CO space is a gallery. Is, uh, uh, to, we, 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 we make 